Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 25 of the Cloud Computing Australia show with Brad Nelson and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show David and I will be talking about Australia and France strike a quantum deal and will work together to develop the first silicon quantum computer. Hi Dave, great to see you on the Australia show again. Yeah, it's great to be back on the show, and it's great to be talking about quantum computing. It's been a while since I've discussed this. Yeah, excellent. Founder and Professor Michelle Simmons said that quantum computing promises to revolutionize the IT industry. How do you see the end game here for Australia then, Dave? Well, you know, quantum computing is different uh, from binary digital electronic compute, uh, computers based on transistors. So this is kind of a fundamental different way in which we do computing. And it's been around for a long time as a concept. There's been... Uh, Lots of patents filed, lots of papers written on quantum computing. It really was designed to be kind of the next generation of computers. However, the stuff that's based on transistors has gotten cheaper, and therefore, you know, we've uh, you know kind of moved uh, a little further and further away from quantum computing. I think for uh, not so good reasons. And this is kind of uh, a very cool story for me because Australia and France are teaming up together. You know, to kind of figure this this technology out together and basically co-sell it and create this uh, this partnership is you know ultimately going to lead to lots of different industries that are going to emerge in both countries. And so, you know, when I look at Australia and I look at France, I see you know com countries with very similar kinds of challenges in terms of their ability to get their IT industry up and running, their high tech industries up and running, things like that. And you have China ahead and US ahead and, uh, you know, uh, other even some of the European countries ahead. And this is kind of the thing that's going to separate them. So ultimately, the end game here is for Australia and France to become very good at quantum computing, become kind of the single place in the universe to go to for this technology. And therefore, people, you know, kind of some uh, kind of equip look at the equivalent of Australia with quantum computing, equivalent with France in quantum computing. And by the way, the emergence of the cloud, the ability to kind of wrap this in a cloud-based system so we can deliver it as a service because cloud computing is really just a consumption model. This will provide value to the country in terms of something that's kind of a key differentiator than, than what we have in some of the other countries. And so, you know, while this is going on in the States, we have a tendency to be very ADD in the States. We'll go after cloud computing, we'll go after you know, containers, we'll go after DevOps, we'll go after any technology that really come, kind of comes down the line. But quantum computing basically is a, is a core discipline where you really have to focus on it. And it's going to take several years to get a product out the door that's going to have any kind of impact in the business. And so I think, number one, they're combining resources, which is good because you need resources to make this happen, both, you know, both money and time and, you know, technology and talent. And both countries have it. And number two, the end state could be like Australia is the same center of the universe and France is the center of the universe in terms of quantum computing. And I think if that's the case, you know, suddenly they own a you know, hundred billion dollar industry, which is what it's predicted to be in a few years. Yes, indeed. So how do you see the natural fit between Australia and France coming together on the quantum computing side of things? Does that for you feel like a, a natural thing to happen? Oh, do I see fighting on the horizon? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's natural based on the based on the maturation of both countries, you know, in terms of size and their position in the industry, things like that. So if it was uh, Australia coming together with China or Australia coming together with the United States, I would look for trouble on the horizon because you have two countries with are very different in terms of resources they can apply to this. Where France and Australia have very similar kinds of resources, very similar kinds of talent. So I think there's synergy you know, in terms of the cultures of the country, in terms of what the end game is looking to be. And, and so the, the governments are very friendly for technology. They, wanna, they want to uh, um, fund it. They want to get it going. Uh, their universities there are very, are very uh, good in terms of teaching technology, including quantum computing. It's going to take an ocean of PhDs to get this going. And they don't have ADD. I, I think that um, the problem with the uh, hugely uh, large countries that are basically moving very quickly, they're trying to change too quickly. And therefore, it is the shiny object thing, which we talked about on the show before, where 
I'm going to look at quantum computing today, but if something else comes along that seems a little bit more compelling, I'm going to move in that direction, then move in another direction, move in another direction. In the United States, we call it pivots. So that seems to be a, a good thing for your company to pivot in different directions. And I don't think that when you get into something that's fundamentally as complex as quantum computing and is fundamentally difficult to build as quantum computing, ultimately, this is going to take focus for at least five years for these countries to actually make an impact. So it's going to have to be a long game approach. But the end of the end of this end state is, you know, suddenly Australia and France owns a great deal of intellectual property around the quantum computing stuff. And that's really kind of where the value the value comes in. And suddenly the governments are getting a huge tax base. People are getting employed um, and the countries are starting to produce additional angles on technology. And I thought Australia doesn't do this already today, but this is kind of a cool angle that they can pick. So they can be very good at something that's kind of a niche in the industry, a niche in the computing industry, not that quantum computing is a niche, it's a huge niche. However, it just feels like something that's going to be successful, you know, versus if they were trying to get into Am Amazon's territory or Microsoft's territory or uh, IBM's territory. That's, that just never ends very well. However, they're trying to get into something that's already an understood discipline, but perfect it and, by the way, fund it together. That sounds like something that's going to have a good in-state win. So good for Australia, good for France. I just hope they don't fight. Yes, me too. We don't need another war on our hands when it comes to quantum computing. That really is not going to end very well at all. Well, you've, you've, you've touched on a very interesting point about IBM. Well, IBM last year released um, the IBM Q, which runs alongside the other products that IBM has in the cloud, such as Watson. IBM Q is intended to help developers solve problems that are readily accessible for current traditional computers, problems that are exponential in nature. So how do you see quantum computing in the cloud as we know it? Do you see, you know, with IBM being involved, in the AWS jumping on board, Microsoft and Google, etc. Well, I don't think it really matters if IBM or, or AWS gets into this business. I mean, IBM is going to be have a have a play in quantum computing, just like they do in AI with the the Watson product. However, everybody has a tendency to jump on the bandwagon. Certainly, with the machine learning stuff, we've seen that with the with the IBM stuff. AWS, at the end of the day, is really just concerned about making uh, computing models consumable. Uh, in different ways. And so if they have to buy the technology from Australia or France, they're perfectly willing to do that. Or if they have to build the technology, they're perfectly willing to do that. However, if you're able to kind of to get into a space and you're able to put a foothold in terms of innovation around patents and creative technology that, that they haven't thought of yet, just because they're not thinking in that way, uh, that's ultimately going to be the success here. Now, obviously, they can steal IP, but it's typically not going to happen at, from IBM or AWS, or you can sue them. Um, but I see AWS, IBM, Microsoft, um, Alibaba, um, you know, CA, all the other large technology companies out there buying the technology if they can, and buying the IP if they can, and if it's if it's bought through uh, companies in Australia or companies in France. You know, that's going to be fine. AWS is just looking to uh, monetize technology through, ad, through their as a service model. And if they have to buy it, they have to license it, you know, whether it's Kubernetes, which is, you know, something that was built by Google that's now in the AWS cloud as well as in the Microsoft cloud, um, they're perfectly willing to do it. So your value is going to be created by your ability to create the technology in the space that's going to be needed two to five years in the future. You know, it's never going to be following technology into the business. So what IBM is working on now, I wouldn't even touch. I would look at, say, where we're going to be in five years with the technology. How do we have to create technology that's going to be innovative and creative around the space, which is going to do something different? You know, we're kind of next generation quantum computing. I'd start filing the patents. I'd start doing the architecture. and I'd start building the prototypes. And then we can turn that into products, you know, with the larger technology companies that will, you know, be the path to your door to license the technology if you're holding the golden keys. Yeah, very good answer. Very, very true as well. Looking to the future for that is very good. Looking at something right now just really won't really give you those answers, will it? No, no, it won't. Ultimately, uh, um, if you're trying to, like I always said as a CTO, if you're trying to co copy or follow people into a market, you're going to be unsuccessful. And, and I, everybody, every company out there tries to do that. Larger companies, they, they wait for somebody else to be successful in the space, such as Amazon Web Services is the best instance of that. And they try to follow them into the space. And then hopefully 
they're going to win somehow. Well, you can do it every once in a while. Microsoft was able to push some people out of the market back in the browser days and things like that. But if you have an innovative idea and you're able to capitalize on it and build a product, then going forward, you're going to have the capabilities that uh, other people don't have. And it's going to be very difficult for them to catch up, if not impossible. Absolutely. And OK, final question for the show this week is, if you could look into your crystal ball and predict the future of quantum computing, what element of cloud computing do you think it would most affect? Uh, infrastructure as a service. I think that will it'll be another service in the in the cloud for us to leverage, just like a high HPC, high performance computing, which is an aspect of quantum computing, by the way. And uh, the ability to do advanced uh, advanced simulation and processing, which we typically bought hardware and software on premise to make it happen. So it's going to be doing what cloud computing does best: is displacing our, basically removing us from having to buy our own data centers and buy our own computing systems. So if quantum computing is just in the cloud, it's going to be cheaper and easier to consume in the cloud than it is in the on-premise systems. We're heading that way. And this is something that's just going to be part of the cloud. And actually, there's aspects of it that are in the cloud, you know, prototypes, testing, things like that. But as far as a full blown, um, you know, no nonsense quantum computing based uh, service within the cloud, we don't have that yet. And I think this is what's going to be uh, going to be provided in a few years. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. What a great show. Thanks for that. I really appreciate you being part of the Australia show this week. Always a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. And remember to like, comment and subscribe to the show the channel so you don't miss out on future shows. You can find David on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. And I'm also on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, obviously. So thanks again for watching and look forward to the shows next week.